Hi there and welcome to Ants Talk. This week we've got a very special guest who's actually a friend of mine. She's got a very intriguing story which I think you'll find interesting. Su Yen Yang was adopted from Vietnam during the Vietnamese War by Australian parents. She was one of the first children to be evacuated out of the country during the war and adopted by people here in Australia. I would love you to hear more about her story. Su Yen, your parents were Australians who wanted to adopt and were possibly going to receive one from Vietnam, Sri Lanka or Korea at the time. They were actually away when the call came to say that you were available. Can you tell us about that? Yes, so what happened was when I was, um, before I was adopted, um, my parents were waiting. They didn't really know when or any time frame whatsoever. Um, So when they were away and the call actually came from my grandmother. So she had to desperately um, seek my parents who were out tuna fishing at the time in Port Lincoln. And um, so obviously communication isn't that easy. Especially back in those days. Oh, my God. But luckily, I came through. I actually arrived here in Australia, in Sydney, and um, before they even probably knew that I was here. The reason I love CN's story is even though she looks Vietnamese, she is a true blue Aussie, and she doesn't identify at all with her Asian heritage. So, CN, have you been back since? Yes, I have, actually. I've been back back a couple of times. Actually, the first time... I was actually working on cruise ships and we came docking into Ho Chi Minh. Right. And um, all the girls on the ship, they wanted to, they were really embracing that this was like base, the first time. And so we walked around and when we went to the markets, um, the attention that I got it was just all these older Vietnamese ladies just staring at me. Why do you think that was? Well, I kind of got a little bit freaked out by it. And then I could see that there was, I I started talking to um, an English speaking uh, person and they said that they can tell that you're you're Vietnamese, but you you have gone and, you know, been grown up. You had a Western. Yeah, Western upbringing. And so then they, I would walk down and they'd want to touch me. They'd touch my arms. They want to touch my nose. They were all like lift, coming up to my nose. And I was like, oh my God, like yeah. this is really bizarre. But the lady said uh, she could tell, they can tell that you're Vietnamese completely by your nose. And they, they've also, I can't remember the name, but they also give um, babies that have actually grown up in Western society. It's a slang word. Okay. And they can tell straight away. <clears throat> straight away. Wow. So did you actually try to find your parents or anything like that? Well, well, when I was younger, um, my adoptive parents, they tried to. And um, because of the Vietnam War, a lot of the documentation was destroyed. Everything was destroyed. So I think it was like um, finding a needle in a haystack, really. Mm-hmm. And then... Obviously, there's a lot of different kind of clubs and groups with a lot of adoptive children. So there's a lot of people that were in the same boat. And networks, I think, had been set up and, like, you know, ways and, you know, means to find uh, parents. But nothing really uh, came of it. Right. And how did that make you feel? Did you feel disappointment? Well, I had only really heard this information when I was older so to be honest with you living in Australia I I I probably don't even think that I'm Vietnamese do you know what I mean I haven't had I don't know any different like since I came here from a baby like my life no is memory, yeah. no my life is my life I have no memory whatsoever about Vietnam at all so I've got really nothing to compare it to so did you have any sort of, was there any, I don't know, inner feelings? Do you know what I mean? Like when you were back Well, I there? thought that, yes. I thought, you know, maybe when I, the first time I went back, was there, go- I was expecting some maybe there was going to be some emotional feeling. Yeah, yeah, connection. But I Nothing. really didn't get that at oh, all. Amazing. So your first father sadly passed away from cancer, but your new father years later actually also adopted you. Tell us that story. So my 
mum's first husband, which was my first adoptive father, passed away. And then as time went past, she met my current uh, father now, who she then married. And he thought that to make it more of a family environment and something we were all as one, he would then adopt me as well. So I could follow on the surname. Right. <clears throat> so I also believe that uh, your sister was also adopted. So my younger adoptive sister, who's from Korea, her story is a lot different than mine. Uh, she can actually go and find, or sh- she could be, um, have success to go and find her adoptive parents. Um, mum and dad still have contact with her foster mother, who right. has basically a lot of the details. Uh, but Cassie, or oh, my younger sister, doesn't want to really have. Um, she doesn't. She doesn't want to. Okay. So you know, some people they look for answers to finding, you know, adoptive parents, sisters, siblings, whatever. But sometimes you don't actually find what you're looking for. So do you have any early memories of around, like, like what is your earliest memory as a child? Well, my early, I don't really have any of um, Vietnam memories, like living there or the the war or anything. My memories are purely growing up. And um, I don't really, I've had a good life. Right. I've enjoyed my childhood. And yeah, all, all memories were just of what I have now. And how do you see your Vietnamese heritage? I'm interested in it. Yeah. I think I've probably become more interested the older that I've become because then I have experienced travel. I'm understanding the culture a little bit more. Sometimes when you're younger, you know, you're too carefree and wanting to hang out with friends and, you know, do all that, play sports and stuff, all that kind of stuff. But now getting older, um, I've obviously learned a lot more. And then also having Vietnamese friends too, which I've never had really in my life. So I've always had Western friends, family. That's so interesting. Um, Do you think that you'll ever have children? Well, I would have liked to have had children, but it hasn't happened. Yeah. So I always thought of myself having children, but it's not the be all end all. And is it something, if you did have children, is it something that you would, like, would you want them sort of to be involved even in that Vietnamese heritage, like in any way? Or do you think it will just, that won't even enter your mind, you'll just bring them up Australian and... Well, no, I'd probably, you know, they'd have to know some things, especially food. Yeah, well, exactly. (laughs) Because, come on. (laughs) Come on now. Come on now. It's delicious. (laughs) It is delicious. It's one of my favourites. I wish we could just go there for the food. I know. (laughs) So, CM, what do you do here now in Australia? So, now here in Australia, I have gone back to hairdressing. So, um... I have been hairdressing for quite some years and I suppose, you know, through my whole career I've worked in salons, I've travelled on cruise ships, so I've educated, I've like, you know, done it all. But at the moment, like being back in the salon, I've just been enjoying like chatting and having like, I don't know, it's just easy for me at the moment. Going back to the customer. The customer, they're hilarious. I love them. Well, ultimately, that's what you're doing hairdressing for is to satisfy their needs, yeah. you know. And yeah, and it's amazing. Yeah, and it's amazing how many times you start talking to clients and people have got like interesting stories. Yeah, you know, I've met so many people that have either been adopted when they were younger and been from a family of like 15, right, mm-hmm. and then finding these siblings at like 60 years of age, right, and you've got all these siblings and just hearing other people's stories that are very similar, you know, to yours, um, which are, are fantastic. Like I've been learning so much just about life, talking to some of my, like, clients. Well, this is Great. funny because we'd actually <laughs> spoken about doing this podcast and when we'd spoken about your past and your history, that's why I wanted to interview you because I found it really interesting and especially in the day and age 
of today where we've got technology and GPS and everything like that. Yeah. Um, but there's still no promise that you could do that and find your parents. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. especially being, you know, the history of Vietnam mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, internet coverage and, and all that sort of stuff. So it's, I found it really, really interesting. And I, I think other people will too, trust me. Um, tell us your opinion on adoption. Well, I think that in the past, uh, when I see the heartache that my parents probably went through um, adopting my younger sister and they also were wanting to adopt another child, um, the cutoff age was 40 years of age. To adopt? To adopt. Whoa. So that was a reason why um, they didn't get to adopt another child was because of mum's age. 40. Yeah, so, nice. you know, like you kind of, 40, you're not even knowing who you are or you're not even an adult at that stage. You're still, you know, trying to put the puzzle together. So, you know. I don't I, think I could have actually had a child at 40. I was still is that Exactly. Enough. So I, for, for someone, for a couple out there that are mature enough to actually want to and can also provide for that child... That's amazing. They should be given the child. Yeah, exactly. I think they should be at any age. I think there's too many um, requirements yeah. for a child, but then, you know, obviously money talks as well. The rich and famous, I don't know how they seem to be able to <laughs> adopt any child that they want. But then again, I won't agree with that because you look at even in our own country with Hugh Jackman and his wife. Yeah. They went through the adopt adoption process for many, many years. And if anything, they became warriors for it because they found it so hard. And with all of their money, they still yeah. found it very, very yeah. hard. Australia has got uh, way too many regulations. Yeah, it, too think. many regulations. And I think that, you know, there are so many children out there <clears throat> that could do with parents. If they're still doing that 40 age bracket, they need to bring that up. Yeah. up. Especially when the waiting list, the waiting lists are a mile long. Yeah. There's so many people waiting for children that really deserve to be in good homes. And like... It's just bad. Exactly. It's terrible. So yeah, things like that, it needs to change. It, it, people like, so then people can make a difference to, you know, communities and society and, you know, different worlds. I mean, I understand the, the government's stance would be that if, you know, if, if, they, if they allowed someone, say, 65 to adopt a child, then, you know, they could possibly only have 15 to 20 yeah. years of life to provide for that child. Yes. Well, when you think about it, we only really offer support in most financial terms till they're 16 or 18, then they go and get their own jobs anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. So they could definitely alter that age group. Oh, for to, sure. To help kids you know absolutely give them a home that's right so see and uh, i'm not factual with all the information but i do know that adoption is actually very low in australia for, especially for australian born adoptees then the, the number is actually higher for overseas adoptees yes do you think it's important to have that ratio equal or would you like to see it you know are you happy with it being at different levels well, obviously for myself, you know, it's fantastic that I was actually adopted from Vietnam. Mm. Um, but when you see Australia with that lower, you know, the levels of adoption, it needs to obviously increase. Uh -huh. So, you know, the cost needs to be adjusted. Well, the cost is, ex it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous, yeah. absolutely ridiculous. And I think that's a lot of, uh, another thing too is that, you know, maybe even some listeners out there, people will have the idea that, you know, adopting a child from overseas when there's children here in Australia to adopt, oh. but, you know, the, you always are hearing an uproar that it, things should happen here first. Yes, exactly. Um, but going back to your own story, I think it's also very important to take note that some of these children that we are adopting from overseas are actually dealing with a lot more serious issues. I mean, not that yeah. what went, the kids are here no. is not serious. I mean, everything is serious. Absolutely. But when we bring in war and, and you know... All different cultures in general. Like, yeah. you know, um, we've known families that have um, adopted from Thailand, Sri Lanka, some being babies, some being 
eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, you know, eleven-year-olds, and some of the some of the really sad stories that um, you hear from the older um, children adjusting into Western society, um, already having um, lived and a lifestyle in their own culture, um, not it's not some of their ways are not accepted here in Australia. That's right. So, you know, you have to understand that these kids are used to doing certain things and, like, it must be heartbreaking to see them doing that because I've heard of families having to give back the child, what, like, their, their, their children. You're listening to Ants Talk. Funny enough, um, I actually watched a television program the other day about the Agent Orange that was used during the Vietnam War and it was a story on um, there are places still today where orphanages where these children are living, mm-hmm. deformed, blind, cripple, many, many things. This is four generations after it was used. Wow. And they're yes. still, you know, dealing with these issues. They were also saying that this will probably, who knows when it will end. It will continue through generation after generation after generation. Um I think that that's the sort of stuff we need to remember when we hear about overseas adoption. Yes. Do you know what I mean? It, it's stuff that we haven't had to deal with here yet. No. You know, like, um, and it being a generational thing makes it a lot more serious. It, it's, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's going to affect so many people's lives yeah, for definitely. so many oh, years. Oh, for sure. So, see, and I've got some fun questions oh, for you. Oh, good. Okay. So tell me, what would your favourite dish be? Um, oh, that's a hard one because I love food. But well, I suppose everyone will probably think I would say Vietnamese. Vietnamese is up there with some of my favourite, like cuisine. But I actually really enjoy Thai food. Wow, okay. Um, I am a lover of chilli. I like hot things. And I like pungent flavoured herbs. Oh, see, I so, love that too, yeah, so I'm loving basil. Do you know what I mean? I love the coriander. I love the zesty dressings with the lime, the ginger, the garlic. Oh my God. Do you know what I mean? The sweet, the savoury. I love it. That's Isn't what that I love. interesting? I wonder if that's <clears throat> where your reminiscence of is your of your heritage is, is your taste buds. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it's. Are your family lovers of chili and yeah, they uh, are love they are lovers of chili. But you know, it, Asian food is in my blood. So if yeah. I was going to go and choose something or go out for dinner or get lunch or whatever, it would be Asian food. Yeah. And then actually, do you know what I just learnt the other day? And look, this is what the Japanese um, at work has said: is that Asian um, intestines are actually longer than the Western person. So the intestines goes for longer. The legs are always shorter and their intestines are actually built for plant-based foods. Okay. Because the, the, I think the intestines are actually smaller and they take a lot longer to actually um, digest. So then if you're eating a lot of meats and all that kind of stuff, it actually doesn't break down that well. Isn't that interesting? Did you know? No, I can't I believe it. So when I go, I feel so much better when I'm eating Asian food. See, I'm sort of like that also. I'm, I actually feel better when I'm, I mean, I'm vegetarian. Yeah, okay. But I feel better, A, when I'm just eating vegetables. Yes. And I love, I just love eating healthy food. Like I, it really... Yeah. Like my body sings when I eat healthy food. Yeah, because yeah. it does it. I think that's um, the, what it does to the actual stomach lining as well and how it actually digests and it's not hard for the body because it doesn't work over time. Too. I also find that when I'm eating that sort of food and eating a lot of chilli, I don't get hungry as much. Yeah. Like yeah. I feel fuller for yeah. longer. And I have got a little bit of a, um, a sensitive stomach, but... When I only eat Western food, I'll have like I'll, I'll be sensitive. When I eat Asian food, like I backpack around all of Asia for like six months, never once did I have any stomach problems. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Um, what makes an Aussie? What makes an Aussie? Uh, I think um, not only is it that you're Australian, 
But I suppose it's the way your lifestyle is and how you live your life in Australia. Because, you know, some some people are Australian but come from obviously other cultures. I don't know, actually. What, what would you think? For me, I, I, think about it's, that. I think it's an openness and an honesty. And yeah. I think that... I mean, I'm not too sure about Asian culture, but I, I, I know that, you know, with, with certain other sort of um, European and, and um, other sort of ethnicities, it's sometimes they're not as open as Australians. Do you know what I mean? Like they won't talk about certain issues in public or with, with other people. They're mm. a little bit more closed with their emotions or with even with um, touching and, you know, mm. intimacy and stuff like that. So I think that with Australians, we tend to be quite brash, quite open, quite humorous. Um, and I see you as that. Well, it's more really like your, it's your upbringing, basically. Well, that's true, yeah. Because that's, yeah, I think so. And then obviously your experiences in life too. Mm. Because as I am Vietnamese, I think of myself as true blue Aussie. Yeah. It's weird. And do you find, so do you find, I, I mean, I've got friends that are Australian with dark skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and they say that they really do notice a difference, They, if not even racism, when they're being seen in Australia. And it's, it's, it's funny because they are Australian, but people will look at their skin colour and, you know, not know whether they're from here or, especially if, you know, they're African descent. Yes. Um, have you ever noticed anything like that yourself? Ah, uh, well, not really. I grew up in a country town and I was very accepted throughout my whole life. Um, I suppose it's more in the cities. Yeah. It's the city ones, the ones that are just wanting to cause a little bit of hoo-ha on the streets. Do you know what I mean? That kind of Exactly. Yeah. Like, I really, I don't really get it. And I suppose... We are very lucky in Australia. We're very multicultural and we are very accepting, you know, to any race whatsoever. So me walking down the street as, you know, Asian, we've got a lot more cultures around these days. Do you know what I mean? To bring any attention. I'm like a minority now, like really, because we've got a lot of other cultures or races in our, in society. What would you say the best lesson you've ever learned is? Uh oh goodness. Um what would you I'm, I'm just trying to think and my best lesson what would yours be? Mine would be to I think that we all wander through life with insecurities, with self-doubt, with that little monkey mind that talks in our brain saying that we're not good enough, all that sort of stuff. I think it's to to still listen to it because I think that we need to hear it to know what we're going to alter. Yeah. But I think that pretending became a really good lesson for me. I just pretended that I was confident. Okay. I pretended that I could talk to people. I just went out there and did it. Yeah. Um, I still have, I'm still riddled with fear. I still have the, the thoughts in my head, but I learned not to let it override me yeah do you know what i mean yeah. i learned to go out there and face it head first yeah even if i wasn't always being sincere being sincere with how i was you know letting it happen yeah it was sometimes it is just acting yeah you know? exactly other times i'm you know i'm really feeling it you know yeah but that would be mine so what would be yours well i think probably when i was younger i didn't have very much patience okay I was always very much, I had to do things. I was probably the same as what I am now. I have to do things now. (laughs) (laughs) And I was very determined. But I suppose when you go through life and, you know, you work like work and meeting all these different people, I don't know, I suppose I've developed a lot more patience for people that I wouldn't necessarily have it for. Sure. And more compassion. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think the... Compassion is really important. Well, well, when you get older, you learn to have all these different things and you see things differently. Do you know what I mean? Even speaking to some older lady or older man, like, who's got all these lessons that he's learnt and all these stories, like... 
I've I've really kind of I don't know like just I really wanted to. I think that's a to... funny thing, you know. Well, from a very young age, I learned very quickly that old people are an absolute treasure. Yeah. Because if you take the time to actually talk and listen to them, it is oh. like talking to anyone our age. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Like they still have sexual yeah. thoughts. They yeah. still have desires. They still have dreams, goals, the whole lot. Plus, they also come with this, you know, encyclopedia I know. of knowledge and lessons learned. And you know what? And people, some people don't give people time. No, they don't. There's no people just like brush people off really fast, and everyone's got the story. And that's what I think at the moment. Even though, you know, I'm where I'm at with my life, but it's very interesting to learn other people's stories. I agree. So, what would you want your legacy to be, CN? Oh, I hadn't really thought about that one, Ant. Um, look, I'm thinking that I would like everyone to remember me for my bright, sparkling personality. You definitely have that. Thank you. I like to have fun. I like to be not serious most of the time. And... I suppose, yeah, that's probably how I'd like... I think like... people would definitely rem- uh, remember you. Oh, and my, probably my cooking as well. <laughs> and your hairdressing skills. <laughs> and my little fingers. <laughs> exactly. I think that we will remember you by those. But, see, and I just wanted to thank you so much for coming onto the show, telling us about your story. I find it really fascinating. I'm sure the listeners do too. Um, but thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Ant. Thank you for inviting me, having my me. My pleasure. My pleasure. See you soon. See you, doll. Bye. Bye. Love a podcast? Love some Ants Talk.